Okay, recording. Um, let me share my screen. And someone give me thumbs up that you can see this web page. Yes. I see it. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So what is Arrow? This is what we're going to talk about today. Um, and I will preface this by saying I just learned about Arrow last fall because I needed it um, for a project that I'm working on. So I don't know a whole lot about it still. I'm still very, very new to it. Um, and uh, But I'm going to have... Um, I'll post links to all the things I'm going to show you here in the YouTube um, so that we don't have to do it here on the on the Zoom. So I'll, I'll, I'll post those links later. But Arrow um, is uh, basically it's a it's a way of storing tabular data. So data that is in a sort of rows and columns structure um, uh, in a very efficient way that is sort of language agnostic. You know, it says it's cross language, right? So you can set up an arrow data set or data table and access that through R, access it through Python and a bunch of other languages, Julia. Uh, so it is a very, very impressive um, platform. It's extremely efficient. And I think it's sort of fulfilling in my mind, a role that databases like SQL used to serve. Um, and I think there's a lot of applications now where if you're using SQL, you could probably switch to this and get some performance improvements and also maybe some conveniences. Um, so it's all rapidly changing, but this is this is my view of it. So there's the official documentation of Apache Arrow, which is this organization. Then there's the Arrow package for R, which is um, sort of R's way of talking to Arrow. And this is what I'm going to really spend most time demoing because I know R better than anything else. Um, but just know that there's basically a similar version to this in all those other languages too. So if you're a Python person, go check out, I think it's called PyArrow, and you'll see how you can work with Arrow in, in Python. Um, there's a bunch of other nice resources. There's a uh, Apache Arrow R cookbook, which basically just has a, a bunch of like how to's on how to do X, like reading a CSV, how to write a CSV, how to do all these things using Arrow. Um, so these are all great resources that I've relied on in my learning. Um, I think if you're going to start and you've never touched this before, the, the getting started part of the R package is really a great demo that just sort of walks through some basics of it. So this is a really great starting point. And I'll also point you to um, Danielle Navarro's blog, which is amazing. By the way, if you're interested in anything related to R or data science, you should just look at all of her amazing stuff. But um, she has a couple of recent posts on getting started with Apache Arrow and um, getting more into the weeds of, of how Arrow and R sort of interact with each other. Both of those are just fantastic posts. Um, they really are accessible. They um, break things down to a very base, basic level so you can understand what's going on. I've learned a lot from just those two posts. So I'm going to definitely steal from some of her examples here um, and just give her credit for awesome work uh, that she does. So um, I am going to open up my little foo.r file. Oh, and the fonts look really small. Maybe I need to increase this so you guys can see better. Hopefully that is a little better, maybe. Um, better, yes. Can everyone like read these words pretty good? Yes. I can okay. see it well. Yeah, OK, good. Um, so for this little demo, you need some packages. You need the arrow package, obviously. I'm also going to use dplyr and ggplot, which is sort of the main plotting package in, in R. I'll load those guys. Um, I've already installed it. Uh, and the first demo is just going to be sort of working with a simple uh, data frame in R and kind of talk about the differences between an R data frame and an arrow um, one. Whoops, I have a bunch of windows open here. So here's your classic diamonds um, data frame. This is a very common one used. This is coming from the ggpop package. And uh, it just has a bunch of observations about different diamonds. So cut, carrot, color. So you pick any row and you've got information about um, uh, a particular diamond. There's quite a lot. There's 53,000 rows. So there's a lot of observations here about diamonds. Um, and you can see how big this thing is in memory using this um, package called lob, um, lobster. And I think it's oh, object size, object size of diamonds. And this is going to tell you just sort of how big it is. It's 
you know, that many bytes. Okay, so now I can create a, um, let's say an arrow version of this um, to show you kind of the, the difference if, of, of what arrow is and how it works. So I'll call it um, diamonds arrow. And the function for this is called arrow table of diamonds. So it's basically just taking this thing, which is in, in R, it's already loaded into R and I'm making it into an arrow table. So now this thing is called diamonds arrow. If I look at it, it looks a little different, right? I don't, I don't see the sort of, you know, if I type in diamonds, you see all the observations because it's loaded into R. This is not loaded into R yet. This is now in an arrow table. Um, and so you can see some basic information like the names of the variables and the type. So caret is a double, meaning it's a number, right? It's, it's a number. Um, things like um, price is an integers. So there's no decimal point here. I think uh, these are called dictionaries, but it's basically characters because there's it's an ordered list of things like co color and clarity have a natural order to a which is a higher value diamond. So that's why they say it's an ordered okay. dictionary, but it would just be a, a categorical type thing. Okay, and we can check the size of this now. All right, so you'll see that this is not in R's memory. It's only 285,000, right? Remember this guy is way bigger. Okay, so, so this is kind of one of the first things that's important to note is that when you make an arrow table, you're not loading that into R. It's now just an arrow table, which is on a whole other level on your computer. And you could access that through other languages. You know, if you've, uh, this is particularly useful if you've got like a dual language project where you're doing one part in R or Python, then you want to create a table that you can then access in another language. You can do that here. Um, so I've created this arrow, diamonds arrow table, and we can access it from maybe Python if I wanted to later. Um, so that's, uh, you know, just to keep in mind here where things are in memory uh, and, and the size differences you, you get. This is just storing some basic information about the, the table, like the dimensions and, and stuff like that. Um, that's why that size is so small. <clears throat> All right, so then, you know, you might wanna do something with this. So let's, you know, make a simple summary. Um, let's say summary counts by clarity. That's what I have in my notes. So we'll, we'll take diamonds. If you're familiar with any of the R tidyverse type of way of, of working with the data set um, and filtering it and uh, sorting out rows, things like that, that's what I'm gonna be using here. So I'm taking this diamonds, uh, diamonds, I can't spell this thing. And I'm gonna filter out, first of all, like let's say I wanna filter for only the um, premium cut like the best diamonds. So we'll say cut is equal to premium. This is gonna, so right now I've got uh, how many rows? 53,000, if I filter this out, I'm gonna only have 13,000, right? So I'm getting rid of all the other ones, I only have premium left. And then I can count um, based on the clarity, like how many are there for each type of clarity are there? Uh, so that's what this little pipeline would do takes the data frame, filters it out, and then counts up how many observations I have for that category. And I get something like this, right? So you can see there's different types of clarity. I don't know much about diamonds and clarity, but there's definitely more of this type um, than the other. You know, we could pick another one like color maybe and count it. <clears throat> but this is all happening in R, right? It's because this diamonds data set is, is in memory in R, I'm able to just, you know, immediately I'm using the R calculation to, to do all this counting and, and summarization, which is not that fast. Um, you know, R is, uh, you know, these are as optimized as they can get, but it's still quite slow on a large, when, when things don't scale very well. Once you get to very, very large data sets like millions of rows, um, this will run, but it's gonna be slower. So let's do the same thing, but using my little arrow data set. So if I had diamonds arrow, <clears throat> this thing, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not in memory, right? It's over in arrow land. If I run this, this is what you get. Um, you're not getting the same kind of, you know, summary table right away. What you're getting is a query essentially, right? I'm saying, I want you to take this arrow data set. I want you to filter based on this condition and I want you to count things up based on color. 
And so it says, okay, I've got a query in my, in my memory, but I haven't executed that query yet. It's just sitting here. If you actually want it to go now run that thing and hand you back the results, you have to pipe on one more thing, which is called collect. Um, I think you can also use compute, um, but collect will actually run it and then give you the results in R. So now this is gonna run and it, it's gonna produce the same thing, right? So both of these now generate the same exact output. Um, if I did this one, it's, you know, at this level, it looks kind of similar um, in speed. But this just did all of these operations, not in R, like none of those operations were performed in R. And in, in fact, again, this thing is, is not even here. It's not, there is no data frame in R's memory. Um, so the nice thing about this is you can, you know, have something, you can write all of your sort of query code in R, but then have it run over an arrow where things are going to go way, way faster. Um, and this becomes a lot more important when you're talking about very big data sets or disaggregated data sets, like data sets where you've got maybe a thousand different files that are all compressed somewhere on a hard drive, like CSVs or parquet files or something. And you want to do this. You want to go across all of those files. I want you to grab only the observations were cut as premium and I want you to count them up by color. Like doing this in R would be extremely hard. You would have to individually read in every CSV file, perform these operations on each of those files, drop the excess and then store it and then loop that. And you'd have to do it for all thousand files. So uh, in arrow, you can sort of collectively say, I want you to point to all those files, perform these operations and then bring it into R, bring in the result. Um, so again, at like a small level, there's really no big difference, but it only really, it, it starts to change when you look at like a large data set. All right, so let's look at one of those. This is my um, project where I, I had to learn uh, a lot um, about Arrow. So I'll, I'll bring in this long path that I've already uh, created. Um, this is a path to a bunch of files that are on my, um, uh, hard drive here and i'll explain a little bit about this whole project as well just for context here um all right so i'm working on this project for, that has to do with vehicle listings right so it's 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 uh i got this data from cars.com but it's basically every vehicle that was ever listed in the u.s um uh over a good chunk of time from like 2015 to 2019 um so there's millions and millions of observations. I think in total, I think it's around 900 million rows of, of observations of different types of vehicles, um, both new and used. And the way the data set is structured, um, originally it was structured like this, where I had just hundreds of CSV files. Each of these are a zipped up CSV file. They're all about 250 megabytes. So if you load one of these things, they're each about two to 3 million rows. Um, so obviously there's no way I would be able to just read in all of these at once. I would just not, it wouldn't fit in, in my RAM. My R would just crash. Um, so what I did was I iteratively first read in each one, um, processed them and then re-exported them as a uh, parquet files. Um, and parquet files are also kind of similarly like a compressed you can think of it kind of like a zip file, but it's a, it's a compressed way to store tabular data. Um, all right, so what I've done when I re-exported all of these things into parquets was I, I created this arrow data set. Um, so now it's partitioned based on a lot of different variables. So I have all these different variables about the vehicle listings, like where nice. was it a used car? What was the make of the, of the listing? What was the model? Um, what type of powertrain was it? Was it gas or electric or hybrid? Um, and I've exported them according to those variables. So you can see like used flag is one or not, one or zero, meaning this is a used car. These are new cars. Um, within these, I have the type of car. Was it a car, pickup, SUV, a van, right? Then I have the powertrain. Was it a gas car, um, hybrid, diesel, electric, right? And then you have make and model. So make, model, and then finally your, your final there, the parquet file. So every single make and model has its own unique parquet file in just the way that I structured this. 
Um, I didn't plan on talking about how exactly I structured that, but um, uh, there's some really great tutorials on, on doing it. It's actually not so complicated. It's just, I think the function is called write data set. That's it. So I'm going to assume I've already got this thing there and my data set is already you know, available. So I'm, I'm going to use this function called open data set and I'm going to use this path. So opening the data set, um, now I have this thing called DS and it looks very similar to like how I read in my, you know, when I look at my diamonds arrow, it also just has some basic summary information about the variables, right? But it doesn't have anything, nothing's loaded into R yet. So data set tells me, um, here's the different variables I have. Those are each column in the data set. I have 2,700 parquet files, right? So there's a ton of these disaggregated files buried away in here. Um, and so now I can perform operations on basically all of those files at once. Um, okay, so I can, I can write code as if this data frame existed in memory, but it, but it doesn't yet. All right, so if I wanted to, let's say, filter out, um, let's just look at, I'm, I mostly work on electric cars. So I'm gonna look at electric cars, filter my powertrain variable is BEVs, um, right? So this is uh, this guy, powertrain. Um, so if you go through any of these folders, you can see here's my different powertrains I have to work with. So BEV is a battery electric vehicle. All right, so let's only look at those um, electric cars and then I'm gonna count up based on let's say the make. So the, the brand of the car. And again, if I run this, nothing happens, right? It's just a query. It's saying, this is the query that you've created. You've told me to filter and then count things. All right, if I wanna run it, I have to say collect. And this might take a little bit, but we'll see how long it takes. Not that long. All right, so just so you're following what just happened there, this just said, go through all of these 2,700 files that are buried in these folders, just grab the ones that are electrics and count up how many rows there are for by make. So you can see there's, you know, obviously quite a lot of Teslas. This is electric cars. There's more of those. Um, Nissan sells more and looks like BMW is doing pretty well too, right? Um, so that's a pretty impressive calculation. Like for me to get to this summary table from those raw CSVs would take probably an hour or more. I would have to loop through every single one, count up every, I would first have to find the electrics, filter them out, count up by make, save that somewhere, do that again for all of my CSVs, and then aggregate all that together. So Arrow is allowing me to sort of interact with this large disaggregated data set in a way that sort of feels just like the data frame is there. Um, and this is, I think, like just a sort of paradigm shift for me in terms of working with very large data sets because for the longest time, the only way for me to perform a, an operation like this would be to load all of those files into something like SQL and run a SQL query to do this. And even that would take a while. Um, we, that's how we were actually working with this data before we discovered Arrow in our research lab. And you know, we had a we had a uh, SQL uh, database on a server in the basement, and we would run. I mean, we had all 900 million observations loaded in at once, uh, and that thing had like 128 gigs of RAM. I mean, it was just crazy what we had to do to to get it to perform at any sort of reasonable speed. And yet I'm running this, I mean, I could run this on my laptop. I'm running it on my desktop, but it's, it runs on my laptop too. Um, so was that a question or maybe not? Okay. Um, so I feel like this is one of those types of demos where like you run it and you're like, okay, it, it, it happens so quick. You don't even notice maybe how, um, like just how kind of wild this is, like what just happened. Um, but anyway, so so that's a quick little demo of the the data set I'm working with, and you know how we're operating with it. We're we're able to move around and work work through a variety of research questions very quickly by running you know little queries like this. I could also you know just bring in let's say all the observations from a particular make and model or, or you know, if I, if I wanted to use it just as a way to read in data, I could, I could also do that. You know, I could say, um, 
filter for my make is, um, I don't know, what should I do? Nis Nissan Leaf. These are cars that I'm interested in. So we'll say make is Nissan and the model is um, the Leaf, right? If I only did this, all I'm doing is saying, just grab all of those listings um, and then collect. And it'll, it'll, it'll load all this. So maybe I'll call this something like um, leaf listings. All right, this might take a bit. I hope it doesn't crash things. We'll see. Does it matter how you have your file structure set up? Yes. So I should, I should talk about like, so this was really fast, right? It just, it just did all of that. And it's, uh, whoops. <laughs> um, so there's all the leaf, leaf listings. It's 630,000 rows. Not that many. If I did like Ford F-150, there's probably uh, 10 million rows or something. Um, so this is an electric car. So there's not, not as many listings. Um, but yeah, that, that reads really quick. I mean, if you watch this, it's, it's a few seconds and we're done. So the reason this is happening even like particularly fast in this for these types of queries is I've, I've already partitioned this. So when you, when you partition up your data set based on you know, variables that are in the data, uh, it can very quickly find what you want, especially if you're doing, you know, filtering. So I'm saying go to these things, making these two make model combinations. All it has to do is, well, we have both new and used. So for each of these, it has to go in and find where they are. Uh, in this case, it's BEVs, Nissan, Leaf. So it only is, it's only reading in that one file. Even though there's 2,700 files, it doesn't have to uh, go find, you know, Nissan Leaf listings that are buried in all of those two thousand files. They're all actually concentrated in just a couple parquet files. So, so that's particularly fast. Um, there's other versions of this data set that I had. I, so I, I've built this in a bunch of different ways, as you can see here. There's like ten different, you know, versions of the same exact data that I've repartitioned in different ways for different purposes. Um, I think the raw one, like just so you can see it on size too, I think this is, yeah, 45 gigs in memory total that we're working with. So it, it's pretty big. The raw one though, um, isn't partitioned by make and model at all. It's just basically a raw copy of the CSV. So if I use the path to this, um, <laughs> this might break things. Well, let's see, let's see if I can break it. Um, let's say I'm gonna point to that data set now it has fewer files. It only has 400 files, but they're not disaggregated. So let's say if it can figure out, um, you know, this, this may not work actually, because I think I've actually, I'm not sure if the make models are cleaned properly, but we can, we can try it. Yeah. And make not found. So I didn't, I don't have the variables organized yet. I done a little bit of processing between here and here. Um, so it would matter. Um, Actually, here, why don't we use this one, powertrain? I think this one's going to be a little, it might have the variables that I need. Um, I think that's all I need to do is change this. And then I can try that guy. Yeah, that was quick. That probably means it didn't even run. Oh, maybe it did. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe I'm breaking things here. But um, so, so for this particular example that I'm working with, you know, there was a lot of back, background work where I initially read in every CSV one at a time and re-exported it to a, a large data set. Um, the, the function is called um, write data set, right? And so if you have a data frame, like you could do this with diamonds. I'm gonna stop this so this doesn't, and it's probably gonna crash now. I think I just broke things. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is what inevitably happens when you, uh, do a live demo, terminate, yes, please terminate. Um, a live demo with very large data sets. Um, let's, let's just abandon ship here. Um, quit, yeah, yeah, quit it and don't save it. And I'm probably gonna have to force quit it because it's, it's just really hating me right now. Oh boy, what have I done? No, that's not responding. I don't know why that's not responding. Your studio quit. Okay, let's let's try and open it up again. Um, and I can kind of show you what it looks like to maybe partition a file, a partition a data set into. Um, 
partition a data frame into a data set. Let's do that. Um, well, now everything's huge. Um, <laughs> sorry for the troubles here. All right, let's go back to this diamonds thing. Um, let's say um, partition diamonds to data set. All right. And what I'm gonna do is I've got I've got diamonds here in, in memory now already. I'm gonna create a little arrow uh, data set. So write data set and I'm gonna write diamonds. Um, I'm gonna write this to my down like to this folder. I think this is where my directory is just to make sure. Yeah, it's in my downloads folder. It's just like a demo thing I have right now. Um, and I think the format is parquet is I think all you really need. And it will write it as a, I think this is gonna write it as a single parquet file. Let's see, no, path is missing. Um, let's just tell it to write to here. Okay, yeah. So that wrote it as one parquet file. All right, and, and just also, because parquet files, I guess, are, are not super common. I had never heard of them a year ago. Uh, so it's just another type of storage. It's, like I said, think of it like a CSV, but it's compressed and it stores things in a columnar way. And it has lots of nice properties for doing things very efficiently. I think that's probably a sufficient uh, description um, for why we might want to use this. It works very well with, with Arrow. So I'm writing this data set. If I write it as a single um, uh, parquet file, that's all you need. I can also say partitioning and I can give it variable names. So I can say, I want you to partition by, let's say, you know, the, the color and the clarity, right? Um, and now it's going to create a partitioned file where now I have these things, right? So there's a single parquet file for every combination of clarity and color. This is sort of a bad <laughs> folder structure because everything's kind of floating around in here. <clears throat> but that's that's all I've done really. So if you've got a bunch of CSVs like I originally had, where I had all of these raw CSV files, what I did was I wrote a loop that read in a CSV, did a little bit of cleaning, and then it exported it using the right data set. Um, and I partitioned it based on these variable names. And so that's that's gonna allow if you're if you're if you know more about your problem that you're trying to solve, you can partition it in a strategic way that makes it really fast for Arrow to know where to look. So, you know, in this case, I, I partitioned my cars based on make and model. And if I'm filtering by make and model, it's gonna move really quickly because it only has to go to one parquet file and read that thing in. So that, that all will matter. It'll affect your speed um, to some degree doing, you know, how, how you partition it. I think you can also do it this way, which is kind of a, a second way to partition. And it works really well with the sort of pipeline tidyverse way of thinking is you can use group by. You can say group by clarity and color, right? And then uh, I'm going to just delete these because they exist already. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then I don't have to have the diamonds in, in my write data set. I'm saying, I want you to write this whole thing. Whoops, oh geez. Okay, so this is another way to do it, where you say, take your data set, group by these two variables, and then write it. And Arrow knows that when you, when you mean to do a group, it's going to create those subfolder structures and partition it in that way. Um, whoops, uh, not DS, this was diamonds. So diamonds, group by that and partition it. And there I go, I've got the same exact outcome here. So that's how I you know, created all of these um, arrow data sets that I have. They, these are all, each folder here is just the same copy of the same thing, but just partitioned in a different way because I'm using it for different problems. Um, that's, that's the basics I think that you might need. Um, you can also just read in a single CSV file. I should show you that like maybe as one other thing to, to demo. I can go back to these big uh, raw CSVs, like pick one of these things and copy the path to it. Um, so let's just say path is this whole big <laughs> long thing. They're just floating on an external drive, by the way. I mean, 
this this stuff takes up so much space it's like i think it's in total like 300 gigs now so i just have it on an external hard drive but it's it's still reading it in that fast um so you have um read csv arrow path this is like your main function for reading in a um a csv file um and then you have this option here as as data frame and you can either set it to true or not if you set it to true it's going to read it in as essentially a, a data frame in R in memory in R. So, so I can say there's the path, and uh, we can let's time it. Um, let's see how long this thing takes to, to read this in. Um, hopefully, this doesn't break. So, this thing is how big? 130 something megs on memory. Um, yeah, okay, like 12 seconds. Um, how big is it? <clears throat> 1.8 million rows and uh, 47 columns. So this is a pretty big, pretty big data file here. Um, now I can also set it to false. I can say, don't read it in. Basically, I want you to read it as an arrow data table, right? So, so it's not gonna load into R's memory. It's gonna look um, just like we did up here where we had this, um, data arrow or it, it, it you know something like this where it just tells you the summary information but it hasn't read it into r so that should speed things up but it's now like if you know all of your operations you want to perform are in arrow like way faster right so now you have kind of everything you need to work with it just has the metadata right it doesn't tell you uh you don't have the data in memory but it's it is you have all the information you need to know like it's 1.8 million rows um, here's all the variables you have to work with. So even if you just wanted to know, like you just wanted to preview the data and you wanted to know what variables are there, what are their names, this would be a nice quick way to do it. It's, it's super fast. You see what you have to work with. Now I could use this to do things. I could say, okay, let's take that data frame and let's, um, filter for, I don't know, price prices above or let's say below $10,000, something like that. Because I can tell, I know price is a number, so that should work. And then I don't know, collect that, and hopefully this should run. Yeah, really quick, right? It went through all of that, and it just gave me back my sixteen thousand rows that meet that criteria. So I never actually had to read in the whole CSV to do that. I I, I read it in as an arrow table, and I let these operations perform an arrow, which was way faster. And um, and then I brought result of that into R. All right, so so that's another way to just really quickly speed up performance if you're working with a large data file, even if it's just a single big CSV, this is going to be a lot faster. Um, okay, that's that's mostly it. Um, you know, I can answer some questions to the best of my ability, but this was this is my take on Arrow. This is my understanding of it, and it's still a very immature understanding of it. I'm learning a lot uh, as I work with this data set, but um, I probably said something wrong. So um, <laughs> people, people can on YouTube comments like correct where, where things are incorrect in this video if they watch this. Um, but hopefully you see the value of, uh, it, it, really, it really starts to become impressive when you've got large, um, large data sets to work with. Which okay. seems to be getting more and more common. People are having bigger and bigger data sets. Yes. Um, even the sizes that I'm talking about here are, I mean, there's many people who would look at this and just sort of, this would be a sample of, of their data. <laughs> it's, you know, you're not, I'm only in 900 million rows. I haven't even reached a billion rows yet. I mean, it's, it's not that, not that big. Um, the, the demo data set, by the way, on the documentation for the R package is um, a classic sort of data set. Uh, um, uh, I think it's under working with data sets. Um, this New York taxis data set. So it has it's, it's trip records of all these taxis in New York. So you can imagine there's quite a lot of observations there. And this it's 37 gigs on, on your hard drive, but I think it has like 2 billion rows. Um, because there's fewer columns. I, in my data, I have a lot of columns. I have like 47 columns. I think there's there's not as many here, but 
Um, they have some really great examples here of, you know, how quickly you can loop through all of these things and um, how quickly you can get summary information over this huge taxi data set. So, what was that? Oh, maybe not talking to us. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Should I stop recording or keep going? <laughs> Well, I guess just to make sure I have it conceptually right. So the data set that you are working with, the big one is all on your external hard drive hooked yeah. to your desktop here at home. Yeah, this thing is on this external drive. Um, I have uh, a bunch of different copies of the same thing, essentially. I mean, it's like a terabyte external drive, but um, these are all you know, like I said, different copies of, of the data, some, so some sort of you, aggregate things. Mm -hmm. So when you did the first thing where you turned the raw into uh, arrow data set, it created those and where those are now on, that's the folder there on your hard drive. Yeah. So the, what I have labeled as raw, these are the raw things I got, you know, when I, when I got okay. this data, it was handed to me like this, where it's just numbered csv files so it's just impossible to know you know what's in there you have to open up something and, or read it in and, and sort of see what's what's what variables you have and things um so what i did was i looped through these i did an initial loop where for each of these files i basically did something of this nature where i read it in uh but i didn't actually read it into memory i just said i used the read arrow uh csv uh and said don't make it a data frame and then I did some quick operations on it and collected what I wanted. Um, and for each of those, I used the right data set to write it as a parquet file. So over here, this, this other raw folder, it's under arrow raw. These are the raw, basically they're exact copies of that um, CSV. You can tell they're almost the same size, you know, but now they're parquet files. Um, so they're gonna read it a lot faster. Then I looped through each of these. And so through each of these, I then I started doing some of this, this kind of work where you can now point to this folder. I can say, go to this raw folder and you know, uh, go find every make, uh, every listing that's a Nissan Leaf or something, collect it in, bring it into R, and then write that again as another arrow data set. And that's how I got to something like this, where I went partition it by make and model. So you can, you can read it in and re-export it again in different ways by, by, and partitioning in different ways to create a folder structure that's you know, convenient for your purpose. So, you know, so what you're looking at and I'm showing you here is all like a lot of work of already processing it to get it into this um, format. But now that I have it here, I, I'm able to work very efficiently with it. Um, and I mean, there's there's a lot more going on under the hood. I think <clears throat> if you really want to get into the details of it, I I would say read this latest post um, by Daniel Navarro on on um, sort of just the magic of what's going on in the background of how Arrow and R talk to each other, because in doing stuff like this, where Arrow knows how to sort of interpret this dplyr code. I mean, this code should it, this is our code, not Arrow code. But it knows what to do when you write this command. It says, "Okay, I, I can convert that into an arrow command." That I know, I know what I need to do here. Um, and so there's there's some really uh, clever ways of of operating with it through using all of these dplyr functions. But there's limits to this right now. I mean, it doesn't support every dplyr function yet, and the arrow developers are you know adding support for more and more things. Um, over time, like I don't even think you can do grouped. If I if I just inserted a group by, like group by powertrain, and then do a count, I don't think this would work. I'm not going to run it because I think it'll break. Um, but I think this is coming soon if it's not already here. So those types of things are, um, I think those are going to really extend this to become even more powerful. Yeah, just okay. the ability to help you organize the data 
and then put it into those parquet files is huge for large data sets like that. Yeah, that's, I mean, that thing took a while to run. I timed my operations. I think the initial iteration of reading it in, um, repartitioning things the first time around was like four or five hours. So I just let it run all night. Um, but then I had a over, you know, one night, the next day I had a data set that I could work with and, uh, and now everything else was just way, way faster. So there's an initial cost. I mean, you, you're rarely going to have someone hand you data in a beautifully structured format. Even, even the format that I got, I, I can't really complain about this. This is, this isn't too bad. This is, you know, it, it's just a bunch of CSEs. They all, at least they all have the same headers, right? They all have the same column names and there's, there's some consistency across them. Um, I'm going to stop my, my share here, but, but, you know, even that isn't so common. Um, sometimes people hand you stuff and it's just a complete disaster. There's, there's different names for each, like imagine any census data. It's probably got <laughs> different county names here. And like the, the names for these counties are going to be maybe different from those counties. And um, I mean, I just, there's horror stories of what people have to parse through. So getting everything structured into this little partitioned uh, data set of a, of a handful of parquet files can, can that alone is, is often worth doing just to make your data easier to work with and sort of keep yourself organized. All right, I'm gonna stop the recording. Seems like a good stopping point. Great.